Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us as we discuss one of the more interesting subjects in the educational arena today. My name is Randy Smith, and I will be your host today as we cover some of the major components of what we are calling IDEAL, which stands for Innovative Design for Engaged Attention and Learning. With us today are two distinguished guests that come from two different disciplines impacting education. We have Dr. Zoe Malo, occupational therapist, who has done significant work in the field of sensory integration in general, but more especially over the past few years, had a focus on evaluating how the room environment, down to aspects of color, sound, clutter, and even the furniture in classrooms, how they may impact learning. We're also pleased to have Brenda Farmer, elementary school principal at Sunset Elementary School in Cody, Wyoming, whose years of professional and practical experience have led her to specific findings on how to improve attention and learning in the classroom. Welcome, ladies, and thank you for being here today to discuss such an important topic. Brenda, when I was in the third grade, my teacher, Mrs. Wyatt, would always say to us, sit still, face forward, and be quiet. How does that apply to classrooms today? Well, Randy and Zoe, that does not apply to classrooms today, but I have heard it a lot. Many people think that you should sit still and pay attention. But although we've heard that, our brains do not actually cooperate. When our, we are sitting still, our brain tells us it's time to rest, it's time to go to sleep. We don't want that in a classroom. We want engaged brains. Mm. So we want students who are moving. Movement comes in a lot of ways and good teachers will be sure that they schedule movement breaks into their lessons. They will schedule ways to have children move throughout the whole lesson. However, at our school, we wanted more movement than that. So we were very sure and very specific to get a chair that made sure that the children could move. Kids move from side to side. They move in their chair. Some of them move sideways like the girl you see in the picture and they're doing their work, with, but their bodies are sideways. Some of them get the wiggle. Some of them want their foot up under them. Some of them want to stand for a minute. They want to move. So we have a rocking chair for every student. They can move at their own pace. Some of them rock and you would think they're going to make you ill from that rocking. Some of them barely move but they rock to what their body needs to keep their brains engaged. Another thing kids do is tilt back. You've heard that a lot. Keep all four yeah. feet on the, um, on the floor. People, the adults are just trying to keep the child safe, but the children are wanting the movement. That rocker chair gives that. And we'll, we have a picture of the rocker chair and we have that student, he can move at his own rate to keep him engaged. Something else that we thought about at our school was the size and what's going to happen with children's feet. Sometimes their feet are dangling and you can see un children that have their feet up, they're not sitting on anything. That is not something we want for our children. We want their feet to be firmly planted on the floor. So we added the foot ring to several of our chairs, their task chairs, and we added that foot ring. Kids can put their feet right on it and they can be, be very comfortable. Now these are things that you probably think everybody has because it's happened in office furniture for adults for years. That is not true for children. Children have had static furniture, hard plastic, sit there, and by the end of the day they're numb and their brains are numb. So those movement breaks have to happen and kids can move with the teacher to wherever the teacher is speaking. So we think that movement is very important and we plan for it in every lesson. Absolutely, Brenda, you're so right. And you know, not only are children sitting in chairs that do not provide the normal kind of supports and movement that we expect as adults, but also most of the chairs they sit in and the furniture that they sit in in schools is not the right size. There's some research that shows that over 80% of children are sitting in the wrong size chairs and desks for their, um, for their height and weight. 
And so we have to think about the ergonomics, we think about posture and position and how important having a, a safe and comfortable position is to pay attention. I mean, we know if we're in the wrong size chair, that it's that's what's on our mind. And um, like we you said- We certainly do that with our office chairs. Absolutely. Our work environments. Absolutely. So one of the challenges as a principal, you can imagine and you know firsthand that children in one grade are not all the same size. Uh, so if we have all the same size chairs in one class, that's going to be a big challenge. And then of course they grow over the course of the year. So if, if they're in the wrong size chair, they're going to be in awkward positions. They're going to stretch and try to move to try to get themselves in a better position. When we're thinking about posture and position and ergonomics, we think about the 90-90-90 rule. We, we want the head at 90 degrees, the elbows, the hips, the knees. And that's just not possible if you're in the wrong size chair. You end up in all kinds of awkward positions, which means you can't really be uh, directing your eyes to the lessons and you can't um, collaborate and work with your peers when it's time to do that. So these stable chairs do not support that when you're talking about the movement that keeps children awake and helps them to stay alert. It also allows them to swivel and turn towards the, the point of instruction and get that kind of movement that will bring them towards the table or away from the table to get to the right height. Uh, if, you're at, if you're too low, you're too high, all that emphasis on handwriting and, and doing your math worksheets and everything else is going to be difficult. Definitely. So not only do the task chairs allow the students to get into the proper position by turning, by getting to the right height. Here we see the foot rings that you talked about, Brenda, how important those are for supporting their feet in the right position. But also in your beautiful computer lab, we get to think about positioning for the new technology. And so because students are now using computers, laptops, handheld devices, we also have to think about the position of their neck. Right. They're no longer yes. just looking ahead, but they're looking down. So we want to be thinking about how they will sit and interact with those new resources as well to make sure that they really can be in a comfortable and safe position for learning. Well, Zoe, modern classrooms are so different than when I went to school. When I was in school, we faced forward. The chalkboard was primarily where the teacher wanted us to be focusing our time. But in today's classrooms, there's focal points all over. And I remember we were working on a project. And one of our friends, and I think you came up with a, a couple of words that I think are interesting, and that's attention pathways. That's a new word to, or a couple of new words to us. But I think it's taking on some significance uh, in the classroom. What do you think? Well, certainly, and, and fortunately, everyone is thinking quite a bit about attention, and we hear about attention problems, but we all can probably do a lot more to think about how our attention is affected, mm -hmm. not only by what we see and hear, which is usually the way we think about it, but all the things in an environment that either draw our attention towards something or make us kind of uh, move away from it. So for example, in a classroom now, there can be so many things that are going on. Yeah. Classrooms can be busy. Sometimes that's enriching and it helps some students to be interested and engaged, but sometimes it can be too much and it almost can cause a student to shut down. So we wanna think about what we call those visual and sound pathways, what will draw attention and what will interfere. Also, as you were mentioning, the changes in classrooms. We used to think about 10 feet away, the distance of the teacher from the students. Yep. Now, with those handheld devices, we have two feet, one feet away, and it's a different pathway sure. for learning. Also, what about the actual pathways that the students take to get from one class to another or to get from one learning area to, to another? Those can either support the student during the day or they can take their mind and attention away. And when we think about how we watch something happening, you know, we have, uh, as adults, when we go to a theater or we watch a performance, we're often in a tiered type of room where we really can see over and we're not having to worry. We don't like it when someone tall sits in front of us. Well, how many of our students have to really strain? So we might want to look at the effect of arranging our classrooms where there is a more clear attention pathway. I think there's some real hope in that area. 
uh, Zoe. I, you know, we, when we went to college, we had a tiered lecture room like you see on the screen right now. And I would think in classrooms that would be a good concept. Not necessarily a concrete tiered platform, but arranging the desk in various heights. It's definitely something to think about. And, you know, we've said we think a lot about vision and hearing, but there are other distractions. There might be sounds and smells and things going on right outside the classroom. Some we can control, some we may not be able to control. But those things that we can control, where we can think about the effect of the odors nearby, the sounds nearby, the, the other visuals, the lighting, and other elements that either cause some discomfort and take our attention away, or those elements that really support us to keep our attention focused. You know, Zoe, I was thinking when you were talking about the handheld devices, technology has come a long way. Many of us are probably very happy the internet wasn't around when we were teenagers. But that in the classroom, we think about that and we want to have those effective, appropriate tools. We want to, our children to be ready for what they're going to encounter outside of school. But what's happening in the classroom to support that? One of the things that we, we do is a lot of classrooms have the smart boards. Kids come up to the board, they can maneuver, um, images on the board, lunch counts are taken there. There's a lot of things that happen on that board. So children are ready. It's not just a chalkboard any longer. They also have their own tablet right here next to them. And children as young as three and four know how to make the tablet work. So we need to think about that in our classrooms. Can we have furniture where we can move over and have one-on-one -on -one if you're doing your own or you're collaborating with your friends over a subject that your teacher has given you. Collaboration and technology have truly changed the way that we are giving instruction and we are helping students to really firmly know what it is that we want them to know. One of the best things I think is being able to have the desks that can be moved into several different configurations. Kids love moving them to wherever they need them. They're the ones who are doing the learning. Why not let them decide how that desk and that chair should be? The vast majority of the product we see in the marketplace today is actually collaborative type furniture mm -hmm. where you can set them up in di different configurations. Mm -hmm. Another thing we haven't touched on today that is really a movement in schools is soft seating also. Mm -hmm. You know, there's uh, used to be that it would be a fixed chair or a fixed table, but I'm seeing in some schools areas that are designated where students can go sit down with their iPad or their handheld device okay. and do some work. Right. I think you have that in some areas I in your school. I have that in my school. Absolutely. And, you know, not only with technology that brings some new ways of learning, sometimes it's important to think about some of the what we might think of as old-fashioned ways of learning, which is really learning through doing. And I think it was you, Brenda, who said that children learn hands first, mm -hmm. which what we mean by that is that although, of course, it's important to watch and to listen, when you do something yourself, when you figure something out with your own hands, with your body moving through space, this process is a completely different process in your brain than just listening and watching. And when we think about concepts like round and square, smooth and rough, we have those as language concepts and thoughts, la images later, but we first learn them through our sense of touch, by exploring objects. And now, uh, in general, children do not have as many opportunities for interacting in the world. They're not uh, having the chance to interact with, in three dimension. A lot of the classes that we used to have, woodshop right. and uh, home economic classes have been eliminated. So we can think about ways that we can add those experiences back so that our students can smell and touch and, and feel as they are really learning how things get put together. And these real life experiences become so important for this, the academic concepts, measurement and spatial arrangements. You know, when, as an occupational therapist, one of the things that we think about is something we call heavy work. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, from the days on the farm, when you are doing that heavy lifting and work, it has an effect on calming and organizing. So sometimes we can find ways to get those experiences for our students with the collaborative furniture. If they move the furniture around themselves, it might uh, spark an idea of how things fit together, but they also get that heavy work. We can help them do some little stretching activities. We call them chair push-ups or wall push-ups and use that kind of action to help our students pay attention. So Zoe, you're saying if I can get my son to uh, <laughs> take up my landscaper's job and cut the grass that he's learning by you, doing that and, and so he's gonna relax, is that what I'm hearing? You tell your son that, <laughs> that your occupational therapist made that recommendation. Very good. It actually <laughs> anchors the brain. It, it is better for learning. And with those classrooms that we were talking about with furniture that can more easily be moved, some of the furniture, some of these desks actually have little wheels. They're almost like a little wheelbarrow. Yes. Yeah. And they have been very important for collaborative learning, but also they actually give the student the chance to have that heavy work during the day and to problem solve themselves. How can we put eight students together or four students together? And how can we divide the room? You never used to see that in elementary grades, for example, but more and more you're seeing that concept now move into that sector. Right, that is true. Well, in the United States, I'm sure you know that it is our responsibility to educate every child. And we are supposed to bring them to very high levels of learning. That is an awesome task. And the children come to us with many varied ideas, many varied experiences, and we're supposed to take that and mold that and bring them to proficiency in reading, writing, mathematics, and also in the arts. So as I thought about that, something came to me from long ago in my childhood, and it's two words which says, everything speaks. And for me, that is true. I grew up in a family where you had everything exactly perfect. You didn't go out until you were dressed a certain way, and you wore certain clothes to this event and something different to the other, and you did not mix them. So everything speaks as dear to my heart. I think of my aunts and my mother. Sounds like my mother. <laughs> it truly is um, something that I believe is important, and I have brought it to my teachers and to other teachers that I know, saying every decision you make for your students speaks volumes. Right. And in our school, as we were, ha we were able to build a brand new school, we looked at every single decision of how that would support learning. One of the first things is color. White. Most schools you would walk into an elementary and they have white walls everywhere. And most people do not know that white is the most disruptive to the brain. It does not help children to learn. And some people have experimented with little off-white walls. They have to be careful because the intensity is not correct, the shade is not correct. They have to think about that. It is real important to think about color, and I think one of the most important things to do is to make a focus wall. Mm -hmm. That focus wall will help children in their eye strain. Their eye muscles will not be straining against that white color. So I think it's real important. I think every single person should look into color. Their color makes a huge difference. Did you know that green helps us to be more productive, if you put that in the walls? Blue is about concentration and thinking. Purple. I really like this blue right here. Well, that's now beautiful. I would say that's purple. Uh, well, the wall's purple, but the desktops <laughs> the are blue. The desks are blue. Mm, that it is gorgeous. It looks purple to that me. That looks nice. But you know, you have that purple for the calming and then the blue for mm -hmm. um, concentration. Now red, that's my favorite color, but you don't want to use red kind of sparingly because that's for short bursts of energy and you really are need to be careful with that color. We have it in our school at many different places and we're having a lot of trouble in the lunchroom. Oh, we think wow. it might be because of the red wow. that's in our lunchroom. Well, I'm very excited to show you a few pictures from my school. This is one, a third grade classroom. You can see that beautiful focus wall that the students have. And you can see that we have three different colors of, chair, of chairs. 
The kids are able to choose the chair they want and the rocker that they want. Something that I think you can see in a picture like this is also about the sound. As you look at this classroom, it's peaceful. It's mm -hmm. calm even when students are in there. And another aspect of a classroom that teachers need to be thinking about is that sound level. We call it white noise. You've heard mm -hmm. about it. Maybe you put on music before you go to bed at night. It's also called ambient noise. Well, one of the things that we had to be sure of because we have concrete floors is in the classrooms we put carpet. On the walls, you'll see sound boards. In many of, the, um, ex in many of our rooms, we have sound boards that are hanging from the wall. It absorbs that reverberation that noise makes. I can just see the attention pathways, yeah. the, the positive attention pathways Definitely that you've can. created here. Sure. You have them everywhere. It's not just that board up at the front. It's over to the side. You have word walls. You have things everywhere for students. And that noise is real important. Something that is also very important is music. We are learning research is just exploding over music in a classroom and what you should do to help children achieve. And one of those things is Baroque music. We know that as parents, we know that as teachers, but we make mistakes. Sometimes we'll think, oh, that's a really great song. I'll get the instrumental version of it. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens then is the children's minds are thinking, oh, what are the words to that song? That's not what we want them to do. So be very oh. careful when you choose your music. Make sure it's Baroque music, 60 bit beats a minute. That's the beat of the heart. Mm -hmm. If you want them to be more energetic, you can choose m music for a different activity. Kick it up to 100, 120 beats a minute. That changes their state, makes their brain become more engaged wow. when you're really wanting that learning. The first thing I did to experiment when I was a teacher was with lights. And this picture that you see on the screen shows you a classroom where you're going to have a lot of issues with discipline and eye fatigue because of the lighting. It is very yellow. It is not the kind of lighting you would want in a classroom. Fluorescent lights have a hum to them. Mm -hmm. Students yeah. cannot take that with their ears. It disrupts their brain. And the lighting here, the fatigue at the end of the day is it would be incredible in a classroom like that. I want you to contrast that. You see that picture and now see this one. Here's another classroom in my school. See how bright it is? The difference is the lights. They are still the long tubes, but they are the full spectrum sunlight bulbs. Now that's they, purple, Brenda. The that other one is was blue. Purple. But anyway, no, that is see. purple. That's it is actually called purple iris and hyacinth. So you have two colors of purple, a little lighter and then the darker purple. But it's very calm, very organized. You can tell this teacher has a lot of things happening for students, but the students are engaged with her learning. So the light, what you're saying is you've got natural light, which right. is shaded a little bit with some kind of curtain or, right. or whatever they call those blinds. But right. then that type of style, that light you have mm -hmm. in the ceiling, that's mm -hmm. creating that fresh look. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It is a white, white paper. It takes away the eye strain. I started that in my classroom about 11 years ago. I had them change it out. I was teaching sixth grade math. And I had a lot of discipline problems. We had a lot of children who the, their discipline was, they were not disciplined in themselves. Mm. One thing I did was change out the lights. Now I was a pretty stern teacher, but changing out those lights totally changed. My ADHD kids were right on with me. Wow completely changed my classroom. I, I just have to add that in addition, there's research for children with autism that fluorescent lights, not only do they have the buzz, they actually have a flicker. Mm -hmm. So when we take right. that flicker away, many children, many people are very sensitive to that and they don't even know it, but they're having a constant irritant mm -hmm. from that buzz and the flicker. So making a change like you've made here is, can be huge. You can see it too. I mean, the, the two photographs are really stark. Well, and think about that noise that you were just talking about. Think, I, my husband and I saw it oh, a couple of weeks ago at our house. We were watching TV and we didn't even realize that all of a sudden the refrigerator stopped making noise and we were like, wow, it was a whole different 
<laughs> difference for our ears. Another thing that I'm sure you haven't thought about, but it is for me, is the aromas. Aromas in a classroom. You did speak a little bit about some negative aromas where we have those sometimes, but we are very careful. We, teachers put things in their classrooms that have a little bit of lemon smell. We want that those positive moods happening. Lavender, of course, we all know that's for calming kids down. Peppermint, sometimes the teachers will just have a couple peppermint candies that they crush. Oh, that has, just helps kids to be more invigorated. They're ready to learn. Something I did also a few years ago was I had fourth graders who were not getting their spelling words. And I squirted some shaving cream that <laughs> smelled really good on their desks and they just played in it and wrote their <laughs> spelling words in it. We cleaned the desk, their hands were very clean. We did all our spelling words on Monday that way. And on Friday, every single student had 100%. Oh, fantastic. Well, you, That's you know, cool. Which, memory. which exactly, you're talking exactly about emotional memory. We all have it. We have a smell and it reminds us of our grandmother's cookies or some place that we went. And that goes deep into our brain. So if our teachers can use that in, a, in such a pleasant way, a fun and pleasant way to make learning really stick. Yeah, I would have gotten in trouble if I had done that. School, so. <laughs> well, aromas, that is something that a lot of people really do not think about. Temperature is something else. Mm. We need our rooms to be between 68 and 72 degrees. And if we are too hot, we are going to sleep. Mm. And if we're too cold, we're thinking about how cold we are. And we want our kids to be thinking about the learning. We have one last picture here for me, and I am so proud of this because this is a hallway. I'm sure you don't think it's a hallway because look how large it is. In our hallways, we enlarged them all because we wanted to have learning happening outside the classroom also. So you see our, de our tables. Mm -hmm. You can see that there's a teacher chair there, and then we have um, our smaller chairs for the students. And then, Randy, you were talking a little while ago about soft seating. Mm -hmm. There's a perfect example yeah, of soft exactly. seating. Yes. And our kids can take their iPods out into that area. They can practice their math facts on the iPods when other kids are still finishing work in the classroom. They can take their books out there and they can work there. They can take their um, reading devices if they have those. And they like being in a chair that is a soft chair. Now, I told you at the beginning that everything speaks means a lot to me, and I want you to know that every single decision that we made from the color of the walls, you'll see they're not white, and you will notice that every single thing is on purpose, and it supports learning. It's the right way to do education today. But I've been in a lot of schools, and I have to tell you, I've seen a lot of foyers, you know, in places where people gather, where uh, you have this type of environment, but I've never seen a hallway until I saw your school <laughs> set, up like, set up like this. And your entire school is like this down the hallways, am I correct? Yes, this is the K-1 hallway, and so we tried to choose things that the kinder and first grade would like. Our second and third grade, we have some camouflage covered um, chairs because our boys love that. And we have a little, some things that are a little different for that, um, second, third grade group. And then we went into our fourth and fifth grade hall. We put some futons in there. We put some kind of space age kind of looking chairs, things that they could curl up in and the chair kind of comes and enfolds them more all the way around because at that age, sometimes they just wanna come within themselves. So we tried to be very thoughtful of the age group that we were in and what kind of chairs and what kind of seating they would like. It's so effective and it's yes, so inviting it really and uh, really just, it does speak. To it everybody. does speak. Well, Brenda, Zoe, you guys have brought some new light to some old topics, uh, introduced to us some new concepts that I believe that can not only help parents with their children, but also educators in regards to their building environments, their color, noise, smell, and even furniture. This has been a great, discussion. In closing, one last comment. Zoe? Well, Brenda, Randy, it's just inspiring to know that there are people like yourselves who so fully understand the needs and what needs to be changed to really support our children and design classrooms and schools 
that will fully allow them to learn effectively. And, you know, uh, even though occupational therapists such as myself for many years have worked with children with special needs, all children need their sensory uh, areas supported and we can really prevent learning problems. We can help all students to be engaged and to do their best at school when we consider all of these areas. So I just want to thank you for the efforts that you've made and the wonderful examples that uh, you yes. have to share with us. Yeah. Well, thank you, Zoe. I've learned a lot more because of your background in occupational therapy. And thank you, Randy, for your help. Here's what I know to be true. I know that with when we learn together, our collective expertise is enhanced. And today I feel that that has happened. And I hope that's true for the people that are listening, and I'm grateful for that. The image of students for me across America being engaged in the learning, excited about what's going on in their classrooms, that's a difference maker for me. And I challenge each of our listeners to think seriously about what they can do. What's one thing you can do to change the environment for the students under your care? I heard something that I thought was a little comical a few years ago. Christine Todd Whitman, she's a former New Jersey governor, she once said, anyone who thinks they are too small to make a difference has never tried to fall asleep with a mosquito in the room. That is true. So every single one of us is not too small to make a difference. And every single thing that we've talked about today is not a small difference. If you took one thing and changed it in a classroom, it could have great gains for children. Well, Brenda, Zoe, thank you for being with us today. For more information about some of the concepts discussed here today, you can go to www.healthymovement.com. We want to thank you for joining us. We hope that ideal, innovative design for engaged attention and learning will become a part of the discussion for students, buildings, and classroom environments within your district and your community. On behalf of Zoe Malo and Brenda Farmer, this is Randy Smith encouraging you to spread the good word and have a great day. Thank you.